Well, welcome to Exploring Catholicism. Many years ago, I had the experience of going to World Youth Day. It was this crazy idea from a Polish pope who said, let's just go out to a field, celebrate mass, and bring millions of kids together and just uh, pray to Jesus. Uh, as you can imagine, most bishops reeled from that, thinking, how are we going to get kids together? What are we going to do with them? And why in the world would we try to connect with kids? This seems to be something for only maybe uh, you know, a gym teacher should be doing. At any rate, uh, John Paul II uh, did not uh, stop at what the bishops were saying they can't do and instead said, well, let's just have no fear and open wide our hearts to the youth. And uh, you know, somebody who probably agreed with him was Jesus Christ when he basically said, let the children come to me. So there's something about that that's in our faith, that's in our background, and it's in our hearts, how much we just love uh, being with kids and the challenges today are just out there. It's just incredible, even worse than like what we could imagine before. It seems like it's harder and harder to connect with our kids. Maybe it's because it's an iPhone generation. But at any rate, what St. John Paul II tapped into was a dynamism, was an energy, was an experience that could only happen when you're together. And I know COVID-19 has brought us a corona time of social distancing, masks, and no hugs. But in some sense, the Holy Spirit is resisting COVID-19 and wants to continue to unite us in creative and perhaps new ways, similar to what John Paul II did. Today on the program, Exploring Catholicism, we have the great grace of, of being able to uh, explore our faith through the eyes of a youth minister and Jason Gualdo. So I'd like to welcome Jason to the program, Exploring Catholicism. He is a father of so many great kids and both biologically and spiritually through his youth ministry. He's a faithfully married man. Jason, uh, but you weren't always on the track of being a biological dad, weren't, were you? Were you also discerning to be a priest at some point? I was, yeah. I actually entered the seminary uh, for a short time anyhow. And uh, what's it like uh, now that you see perspective from the church, not as a seminarian or a priest, but just as a layperson? Um, yeah, what is that like? It's... Um... I feel like my, you know, the Lord's path of calling me through the seminary uh, and into to family life, uh, in a lot of ways, those seem like two different things. I feel like it's the it's the the same thing. Um, the Lord was calling me to some sort of fatherhood, uh, and He was calling me to some sort of leadership role within the church. Uh, you know, it's gone from a parish church to my domestic church, um, but it's uh, it's been very much the same call. Now you're a member, obviously, here of our great grouping, one of our great staff members, helping to row the ship forward and bringing as many people to heaven as possible. Did you grow up around here or where are you from? I did, yeah. I'm from about uh, 15 minutes south of here in Kennedy Township, right beside, right between Coriopolis, McKees, Rocks, and Robinson. So yeah, we're recording this up in Franklin Park and it's exciting to think that he's somebody who's grown up in our community right near where we are in the great grouping. And how many brothers and sisters did you have? I have one older sister and one younger brother who is also on staff in the great grouping. So you're kind of like the sandwich child. I am, yep. <laughs> And uh, how about your parents? Talk a little bit about maybe the influence of your mom or your dad on your faith. Yeah, so my parents, um, you know, I, I, I like to say one of the singular blessings of my life is that I don't remember a moment when I didn't know Jesus as a person. Uh, and I attribute that to my parents. They were um, they were both Catholic. Uh, you know, they kind of followed the normal path of they got into to college and sort of drifted away a little bit. They started having kids and came back. And so I remember growing up, uh, we would always go to Sunday Mass. You'd never miss Sunday Mass because something horrible would happen. Uh, like you might end up in hell or something awful like that, but it wasn't <laughs> wasn't much more than that when I was really really young, until God got a hold of my mom when I was in about first grade, uh, and she had kind of a big reversion moment with the charismatic movement and the Marian movement, um, and I was convinced it was all about me because I was getting ready for first communion. <laughs> so <laughs> I, tried, I tried to tell parents seize those sacramental opportunities because your kids will not question. Why are we going to mass more often? Why are we praying at home? Why are we reading the Bible? If they're getting ready for a sacrament, they'll think, hey, this is cool. It's about me. So you remember your mom's faith journey. Uh, yeah. You know, when you're before she had that conversion, what was family faith like? And after that, what was it like? Uh, it seems like there was a turning point that you talk about there in first or second grade. Yeah. Yeah. Before that, it was um, it was kind of just something that we, you know, we, something that we just did. We went to mass on Sunday. Um, I went to Catholic school for kindergarten and first grade. Um, so I went to mass a couple times a week uh, via school and, and my family. Uh, but after my mom's conversion experience, 
things shift a little bit and it wasn't really a big dramatic shift, right? It was, um, we'd come home from mass, you know, on the, the short drive home from mass. I live in walking distance of St. Malachy church, uh, now Archangel Gabriel parish, but she would just ask us, you know, what, what stuck out to you at mass? Uh, did you like any of the songs? Did father say anything in his homily? Um, any of the prayers stick out to you? And we just sort of share one or two things that jumped out to us. And that was really it. Um, after a while, she started trying to, to get us praying a family rosary. Uh, and we did do that for a while. Um, to this day, if I start praying the rosary, I start falling asleep because we did it at bedtime as a kid. <laughs> um, Which isn't a bad thing if you have a big family. You'd probably that's what I'm saying. Pray the rosary with your kiddos. They'll, they'll fall asleep. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, what what role did your dad play in your development of just growing up? Yeah, my dad, um, to his credit, so my, I think both of my parents would be comfortable saying my dad wasn't as on board with my mom. He kind of thought she was a little bit crazy early on. Uh, but to his credit, he was never visibly opposed to taking the faith a little more seriously. Uh, and he would come in, he'd pray the family rosary with us. He'd say the prayers, he'd lead his decade. Um, and I think over time, uh, it became more of a personal thing for him. Um, you know, he'll tell me now to this day uh, when he's dealing with the trouble, he'll go out in the morning, walk his dogs and and pray the rosary. Hmm. Um, so it's a, a much more personal thing for him now than it, maybe it was early on in my mom's experience. Did you play sports growing up? What was Jason Gualdo like in eighth grade? Oh gosh, you don't want to see an eighth grade. <laughs> no, in eighth grade, I was playing basketball because I was one of the taller kids in my class. Um, my theory on basketball was I'm one of the taller kids around. If I stop the other team from scoring, there's four other guys on my team who can score the points for us. So you were a defensive specialist. Yeah, you could say that. <laughs> and uh, what, talk a little bit about your mom. Um, I know uh, right now she's watching you from heaven. Yeah. Uh, what was that like, uh, losing your mom? How old were you? And what effect has that had on your life? Yeah, so my mom passed away at Christmas time uh, about seven years ago now. Uh, my second daughter had just been born earlier that year in February. Um, so my mom had been diagnosed with breast cancer uh, a few years back, you know, went through uh, surgery and chemo and all that sort of stuff and was in remission for a while. Uh, and then it came back. Um, and just the way she handled it was incredible. Um, I still have her, her diaries and I still read them from time to time. Uh, and she said in there, you know, I'm not afraid of dying. Um, I'm just kind of afraid of what my family's going to have to go through in the process and, and, you know, is it going to be painful and all that sort of stuff. But she had no, no concerns at all about the afterlife, no questions that, yeah, there is an afterlife. I'm going to go to a good and loving God. Um, so just the, the courage that she showed in going through that, uh, I think has helped me a lot throughout some difficult moments in my adulthood, um, you know, dealing with Corona time and on mission and family strife and all that sort of stuff. Um, I, I remember a lot, my mom's example of, this is what the Lord wanted for me. This is what's best. I don't have to understand it. So what were the circumstances that surrounded her passing? Yeah, so the uh, the breast cancer came back. Um, they tried a couple different rounds of chemo and different things, and it wasn't working. Uh, cancer metastasized, and she finally decided, you know what, enough is enough. Um, we can drag this out, or we can just accept that this is the Lord's lot in life. Uh, she had, I remember at one point she reflected, and she said, it kind of fits her life like a glove. That's sort of the way that her, her life would go. <laughs> she kind of had her own plan in mind and then something would change and she'd have to adjust and um, what so, yeah, were those, just handled what, it with a lot of grace. <laughs> and for you personally, what were those conversations uh, like with her? She showed you such courage, such dignity and such a tough time. They were incredible moments. You know, th there's a period in my career where I wasn't working in parish work. I was selling life insurance for the Knights of Columbus. Mm -hmm. um, so I sold life insurance, long-term care, disability and annuities. Uh, and I think, you know, sometimes I would be driving around my territory with Beaver County. I'd be driving around Beaver County thinking, Lord, you've, you, you've fitted me for ministry and I'm selling life insurance, which there's a ministry aspect to that. But why am I doing this? Uh, and I think it was he was preparing me for my mom's passing and to help prepare my family. Um, so I got to have lots of great conversations with her uh, and thank her for things. Like, mom, thank you for teaching me how to, how to do laundry and iron my own clothes. Uh, and <laughs> for the rest of my life, whenever I'm ironing my shirts for work, I'm going to remember, mom taught me this. Thank you, mom. Um, I got to thank her for uh, showing me her prayer life and her spirituality. Because um, she would, she always had this morning routine of, of reading her, her Bible and whatever devotional she was reading at the time. Uh, and she would frequently share with me not in elaborate language or anything like that, but this is what I think the Lord is, is saying to me through my prayer time. Uh, and she always thought she was horrible with words, but that's one of my my uh, most cherished memories of my mom was her sharing. This is how I think God's talking to me, and I think I, I 
I saw these things connecting. Uh, I'm noticing this pattern in my life. Um, so I was able to express to her a lot before she passed. Thank you for teaching me how to pray. <laughs> thank you for teaching me how to be a, a fully functioning adult. <laughs> Uh, and thank you for all the sacrifices you made for me growing up, because at this time I had two young kids. So I was starting to see some of uh, what a kid never notices that their parents do for them. So your mom wasn't necessarily a doctor in theology and philosophy. She was a woman who uh, recognized God's presence and allowed that to lead her in her life. Yep. Yeah, she would have been convinced that she was the wrong person <laughs> to try to form me in the faith. <laughs> See, I always picture your mom or your dad being like St. Thomas Aquinas and you sit around the table and you go through the different big questions of life and, yeah. <laughs> and, and you passed all the classes and so now you're here, Jason Gualdo. Yeah, no, my mom, my mom read a lot, but she, she always lamented the fact that she couldn't remember a lot of what she read. Um, but she recognized in me a tendency to, to like to read, to like to research, to ask bigger questions. Um, so she would feed me books and ask me what I thought about it <laughs> instead of her reading it and telling me. <laughs> now, um, as you started to, where'd you go after, where'd you go to high school? I went to Our Lady of the Sacred Heart High School. Oh, nice. Yep. And then from there, where'd you go? Uh, from there, I did my undergrad work at Pitt. I uh, studied philosophy, classics, and writing. Uh, and at that time, I, you know, I, I thought about priesthood from about second grade. So by the time I got to Pitt, I was debating about, should I just go to St. Paul's and go to Duquesne? Um, so part of my philosophy degree was recognizing I might be going into the seminary at some point. So this would be a good background to have. What was the inspiration or motivation that made you think at one point that you were called to be a priest? Was there a specific moment in your life that you're like, wow, this seems to be where the Lord could be leading me? Yeah, I don't really remember any one moment. I just, uh, it was never an odd thought to me. Um, you know, I remember it, you know, in high school, I was one of the few guys who was willing to say he'd ever thought about being a priest. So I had to give a witness talk all the time. Uh, and I would say then, you know, when I was, I, I always, it was always one of those things that I had thought about doing. Like I might want to be a firefighter. I might want to be a dinosaur. I might want to be a priest. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we had we had lots of uh, you know priest friends growing up. Um, Father Mike Caridi, who married Natalie and I, uh, was a seminarian at St. Malachi, so we had him over for dinner all the time. Uh, and I remember um, one of the parochial vicars in particular, Father Paul Stodd, God rest his soul. Um, he had a dog that he rescued. He found in the woods somewhere, but uh, the pastor wouldn't let him keep the dog at the rectory, so he kept Kiwi at our house. He'd come to our house, play with his dog, <laughs> smoke his cigarettes, and then go back home. <laughs> so that was your image of priesthood, huh? Yep, was he's a normal guy who will occasionally bless some holy water for us. And <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as you were discerning the priesthood, all of a sudden this incredible woman just fell into your life, right? Yeah, she sure did. So I was, <laughs> you know, my time at Pitt, I was the whole time thinking I'm I'm probably going into the seminary at some point. I was still open to dating and whatnot. Um, really came to a head for me. I spent a semester in Austria and I got to go all over Europe throughout that semester. Uh, it was the, the semester that John Paul II passed away uh, and Pope Benedict was elected. Um, but I was praying at the tomb of St. Therese of Lisieux, uh, who at the time was a, a huge influence in my life, um, and asking her, give me a sign and I'll transfer right now. You know, as soon as I get back to the States, I'll go into the seminary. I even called my mom before that trip and told her, get ready. I'm praying on a sign. And as soon as I get it, I want to transfer. Uh, and I'm praying at Therese's tomb. Uh, and she told me, just, just wait, uh, which floored me because I thought, like, <laughs> you're a saint. We need priests. Why would you tell me not to do this right now? Uh, so I got back to the States and figured, oh, I'll go back to my job at Family Christian Store in Robinson um, while I try to figure out my life. So I walked into the store and told you know, my supervisor at the time, Jack, you can go ahead and put me back on the schedule. He wouldn't even let the words get out of my mouth. I walked in the door and he said, Jason, I hired this girl, Natalie. You're going to love her. <laughs> uh, and I ended up marrying her. <laughs> what was the first impression you had of Natalie? Uh, I still remember. She was walking down the, the, the aisle there, the bookshelves in the, the um, Christian living section. Uh, and I just remember thinking she's a, a, a very pretty girl, um, but I'm probably going to be celibate. So that doesn't really matter, but she's a very pretty girl. <laughs> uh, and praise God, Jack decided to schedule us together all the time. So we got to, to share an awful lot uh, about our faith lives, our personal lives, um, and get to know each other quite well without actually, you know, we got paid to date for a while there. <laughs> what would you, looking back at that uh, relationship had developed, what were some of the, the key moments that helped you realize you were called to get married? and called specifically to, to marry Natalie. Yeah, I think um, the call to marriage really, actually the seminary helped me with that a lot. Um, I was only in the seminary for a semester, so four months or so. Um, but they, I remember them asking me throughout the interview process and spiritual direction for years ahead of time, uh, what excites you about the possibility of being a priest? And I said, ministering to families. Um, so when I was in the seminary, my spiritual reading uh, for the, that whole semester was uh, Familiaris Consortio, John Paul II's encyclical on the family. 
Um, so I was doing a lot of meditating on family life um, in the seminary specifically, but also beforehand. Uh, with respect to Natalie, it was, um, I think our relationship was founded on Jesus from the get-go um, and focused on praying together a lot. So we recognized early on that there was an attraction. Um, she, Natalie's quite a few years younger than me, so we, we weren't going to date for a while anyhow. Um, but, you know, the whole time we were praying, from the time where we, we expressed interest in each other, we were praying about, all right, God, what do you want to have happen with this? Because I was open with her from the get-go. I feel like God is probably calling me into the seminary at some point, and that means celibacy. Natalie was Episcopalian at the time. Um, so I had to explain to her, you know, we do, <laughs> pastors are celibate. We don't, you know, we're not, you're not going to be a pastor's wife <laughs> in this church. Um, so from the get-go, we were kind of praying about, all right, Lord, we feel like you brought us together for a reason. The, the pieces don't fit together yet. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So just tell us what to do. And how has um, her background in Christianity and your background blended together in your family now? Yeah. So she, I mean, I'm sorry. Did she convert? Is she still yeah. Episcopalian? Where is she in terms? Yeah, so of Natalie did convert. She is, she's Catholic yeah. now, uh, and she would express it, uh, I think, quite beautifully as she didn't feel like she was turning her back on her Episcopal upbringing because she had a beautiful experience growing up with, uh, you know, her church community and her her youth group and all that sort of stuff. She really saw embracing Catholicism as expanding upon that and fulfilling it even more. Um, so it was kind of a, a lot of our, our relationship dynamic was, you know, I was the, the token Catholic at this this bookstore. There were a couple others of us there as well. But we, we were always the ones who were being asked, why do you guys worship statues? What's the deal with Mary? Why is there a pope? Um, so it was a, a very apologetic position, not in a, a saying, I'm sorry for the faith, but constantly having to explain the faith to people. Uh, so when Natalie and I met, she knew the, all the Catholics she knew were habitual Catholics, didn't go to mass on a regular basis, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and I'd never met an Episcopalian before. I'd read about these these mythical creatures that were somewhere in between, <laughs> you know, evangelical and Pentecostals and Roman Catholics. So we both kind of had a, a we we're very interested in talking to each other about well, what do you believe about Jesus? What do you do on Sunday? Um, so yeah, that kind of we had a lot of lot of conversations around that. Uh, and I told her from the beginning, um, you know, if we end up getting serious and getting married, uh, there's no expectation of you to convert on my part. Um, as long as you don't have animosity towards the church, I, we'll have to raise the kids Catholic, but we can go to mass on Sunday and go to the Episcopal church service after that or vice versa. Um, Why do you think how complicated that might be? But <laughs> This might be a little more philosophical than uh, yeah. that we want to go. But uh, what is the relationship that you've experienced with Natalie of freedom and love? Um, why wouldn't that be a criteria uh, to perhaps invite her to be Catholic before you got married? Yeah, I think um, I think she know, knew that the invitation was there. But yeah, to your point about freedom, um, I feel like for, for the same reasons I needed the freedom to go into the seminary uh, to, so I, I always worded it as I need to be a man worth following. And if I feel like God is calling me to go into the seminary, even if that doesn't make sense to me, if I say no to that, then I'm not worthy of Natalie or anybody else following me. Um, and I didn't want to, not do, not discern priesthood, go into the seminary, not go into the seminary and have some midlife crisis later and think, uh, you know, now that I hit a hard moment in marriage, perhaps that's a sign that God called me to be a priest. So analogous to all that, for Natalie's sake, um, she needed the freedom to explore it on her own and accept it on her own uh, and not feel overt or even uh, indirect pressure that in order for our family to be happy, you need to do this thing. Um, faith always has to be proposed and never imposed, uh, which is often easier to say than do. Yeah, and I, I think uh, eventually I'm going to get to talking a little bit about your family and your kids, but I'm going to put that on pause for right now and, and just really segue what you just said about proposing instead of imposing. I know growing up that CCD for me was a lot like Catholic detention center in which uh, you were forced to go into a classroom with a, a person who was wonderful, but they didn't engage you. The, the only time I would go to CCD in seventh and eighth grade was when there was free pizza. There you um, <laughs> If we start to look at uh, where uh, the faith formation is in our youth today, and just seeing kind of a big picture, how would you categorize the status right now of our Catholic youth movement and the development of Catholic youth overall? Where do you see that as a big picture item, post-Vatican II, here we are in 2020. Where do you see the big picture of our youth today is? Yeah, I see, um, 
I see youth formation today as kind of a, a natural byproduct of where adult formation has has gone or really not gone uh, for the last several decades. Um, and what I mean by that is this, the church has done a very bad job of catechizing adults for quite a while. Um, and then we'll shame parents for not forming their kids properly or not supporting our efforts to form them. Um, I, I'll, I'm, I'll never shy away from telling parents, it's our fault that you don't know how to do that job. <laughs> Uh, we didn't tell you how to do it. We didn't model it for you. A lot of you didn't experience it in your home. Um, so what does that mean specifically for youth? I think kids have a natural desire for God and a natural religiosity about them, a natural religious curiosity. Um, often it doesn't find enough healthy outlets or enough supports, so they kind of have to stifle it in some ways. Um, but, I mean, you can see it in, in all the, the statistics, right? The, the, the culture is becoming less religious, but levels of spirituality and, and spiritual curiosity are at the same level or even higher. Um, so there is a natural desire within the human heart for something deeper, something more. We, human beings have always recognized there's a higher power. Um, they're shying away from the institutionalized, um, force it down your throat kind of approach that we've taken for quite a while. Yeah, you know, I, when I was growing up, I remember uh, I was on a little league baseball team and uh, the coach one day just quit. And my mom was on the bench, uh, you know, in the, the stands, probably babysitting one of my little brothers and sisters. I was one of eight. And all of a sudden, there we were out on the field without a coach. <laughs> and she jumped in and coached the team. We hadn't won a game all year. And somehow we backed into the playoffs because one of those things where everybody made the playoffs. We ended up not losing, even though my mom had never coached baseball before. Yeah. Do, you, do you feel like uh, parents sometimes uh, feel intimidated? Maybe it's the caller. Maybe it's uh, the faith. It, it's I, I mean, I've always seen parents jump into anything. If you know, if their kids in a drama course or whatever, all of a sudden they'll, they'll start singing with the kids. They'll do anything yep. to engage their kids. But it seems like when it comes to to our church and our parish life, that there are these obstacles that just like stop them from from doing that. And I don't know. Do you ever see that? And what are those obstacles? How do we remove that so that we can get that full welcoming? Hey, let's get all together here. Yeah, I love that point because I feel like that's the the big hurdle in parents embracing their role as primary. We call it the primary catechist of their kid, right? Primary educator. Um, for better or worse, parents are the ones who are teaching their kids the faith. And they're the ones who are modeling the faith for their kids. Um, some parents will readily admit I'm not modeling it well and I'm not teaching it well. Um, but you are the primary model. Everything we do as a parish is purely supplemental to what we do at home as parents. Uh, I'll point out to parents, if you bring your kid to every single session from kindergarten through confirmation prep in eighth grade, we have your kids for a little more than 11 days of their life. Wow. It's not a whole lot. <laughs> so even if we are the, the, the primary voice of systematic theology and language and all that sort of stuff, it is purely supplemental to what they're getting at home. The, the problem has been we have presented this as a difficult task for parents. Uh, and quite often we have said, well, you can't handle this. So we'll take your kids from you. We'll give them to the experts. They'll explain the faith to your kid and then we'll send them home to you because you wouldn't get it right. Uh, and I think there needs to be a freedom of, um, first of all, parents know their kids better than any of our volunteers possibly could. Um, so they're gonna, they're gonna know their kids' questions better. They're gonna know what's behind the question better. They're gonna know how their kid learns better. Uh, than we do. Uh, their influence is far more important. I mean, not to downplay the influence of a catechist or a core team member by any stretch. Uh, there's an important relationship there, um, but you, you can't replace a parent. Um, you can't even try. It's, it's inappropriate to try to, and it's quite frankly impossible to replace a parent's role in their kid's life. Yeah, I, I, you know, uh, a group that influenced my faith development was Young Life. And uh, recently, well, before Corona time, we were engaged in some really cool conversations with them. And one of the things they said uh, was that you need to earn the right to uh, speak to children and to mm -hmm. kids and to the youth. And in some sense, that's what you're saying. It's like the parents have given birth to their child. They've The parents have raised their children. They've, they've uh, fed their kids. They've sacrificed themselves. So they've earned that right to form them. Um, how does that translate, though, into the the real uh, probing and, and getting to know Jesus and developing a relationship with Jesus from a parent's perspective? Yeah, the key is for, for parents to have that relationship first. Um, I don't know. I mean, again, I've been blessed with I, I don't know a time when I didn't know Jesus as a person. Um, but I also recognize as a parent, um, I need God far more than I did when I was single. Um, 
Kids are frustrated. They're beautiful, frustrating little mysteries. <laughs> uh, marriage is a beautiful, frustrating little mystery. Family life is a beautiful, frustrating little mystery. But it's a mystery that God has given us immense insight into all along the way. It's the primary image that God tries to use for his relationship to us. Um, and I've often said, you, you know, you can look at the, the scriptural story as um, God raising his kids. <laughs> you know, in the Garden of Eden, is they're in the infant stage, right? Parents will appreciate this. There's one rule. Don't eat from that tree. <laughs> What do they do? They, they mess up that rule and then all the rules follow after that, right? Um, to, you know, their, their early childhood phase when they're, you know, in slavery in Egypt and, and getting to the promised land and then the teenage years with the monarchy and all that sort of stuff. Uh, it, it, it mirrors family life almost identically. Um, and it, there, there's circular ebbs and flows to it too. But man, as a parent, I need to, <laughs> I don't know how I would do this without God. Right. Yeah, that personal relationship is the key, right? I think that when you see parents who um, trust that God loves them and cares for them, then why wouldn't they want to entrust their children uh, to the Lord? Yeah. Have you seen in your own uh, working with the youth uh, parents and um, ways in which they've been creatively engaged in their in their faith development of, your, of their children? Oh, yeah. There's lots of families doing uh, lots of beautiful things. We've got... Uh, and it differs from from age group to age group. When they're little, it's it's in a lot of ways it's a lot easier, right? You just you read them Bible stories, you sing songs with them, um, you incorporate little rituals at bedtime and things like that. Um, when they're older, you have to get a little bit more creative sometimes. I think for older, you know, for kids who are are asking questions and things like that, we've got lots of families. I'll get emails from them on a regular basis. My kid asked me this. I have no idea how to respond. <laughs> Uh, and they feel apologetic asking me the question, but I tell them, thank you. This is my, this is what I want to do. Uh, you, you need to have these conversations at home. The fact that your kid is asking a question isn't a bad thing. The fact that you don't know how to answer it isn't bad either. <laughs> um, so there's lots of families who are just that come up with questions. You know, what, what you heard that reading at mass on Sunday, what question do you have about it? And I'll go ask Jason or, or one of the priests or somebody else on staff. Um, Lots of families love to, to just kind of read through a, a catechism or a resource of some sort at home, you know, a couple questions a day, um, just so that the faith, you know, the faith is continually being revisited at home. Um, but lots of other things that aren't even as, as programmatic and systematic and structured as that. Uh, we've got lots of families who, who are just committed to service, um, not just because it's what nice people do, but that's what, what, because that's what disciples of Jesus do. Um, they want their kids to experience um, serving somebody and staring them eyeball to eyeball while they do it. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that is so important. In fact, I think we have an example of you doing this with your kids, maybe a little best of growing with Gualdo. During this Corona time, we've decided to do a lot of things, obviously, through um, live stream and through video content because we just can't be around. And so Jason was gracious enough to open up his living room and his children's hearts to the hearts of our great grouping and beyond. And so if uh, we can cue that up, I just wanted to show our audience a little bit of what, what it's like to grow with Jason Gualdo and his dear wife, Natalie. Hey guys, welcome back to Bible stories and songs for our bigger kids, our elementary school kids. We have a table and below that table, <laughs> we have Jacinta again. We have some rosaries and prayers. <laughs> So what were you guys doing there? Is that a faith formation? It seems more like a volleyball game without a net. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, all of that was various renditions of faith formation done in my house instead of on our on our property. <laughs> Wait, you mean you can have fun and engage and really get everybody engaged in a faith formation moment? Absolutely. And in fact, it's much more effective and easier if you have fun with it. <laughs> Uh, so what, yeah. were, what, what were you guys doing there? What were some of those things going on in that? Yeah, we were we were doing uh, the first one. There was story time and songs for older kids. So we were just reading a, a Bible story, giving a little bit of commentary on it, and then singing a fun song that may have had something to do with it or maybe nothing at all. Um, just some of the fun songs we sing at faith formation sessions here. Um, you know, the instruments, the egg shakers, and the balls bounce around and all that. That's from a program called Making Music Praying Twice, uh, which is for newborns up to age five with a, a parent or a guardian with them. Um, and that kind of, I think, encapsulates really what we're, what we're trying to get across to families to form, form their kids in faith. The whole point of that program is have fun with your kids with music and with prayer. 
because uh, music is a, a very developmentally appropriate way to do this with little ones. Uh, but I would take that message all along the age spectrum with your high schooler. Um, have fun with them with prayer and with faith formation. Um, with a high schooler, that might look different. It might be, you know, debate. What, what don't you like about this doctrine? What don't you like? What don't you understand about this? Tell me why it's wrong. Um, have fun with it. It's it, lighten up a little bit, right? Have fun. Jesus. Sir, are you saying that life. we don't need a textbook and a chalkboard and a formal classroom setting? For some kids, that's the way they learn. Go for it. Uh, for the vast majority of people, that's not the way that the faith is handed on. The, f the faith is not a, a, a purely an intellectual endeavor. Certainly there's an intellectual part of it, right? There's real content to it. And there's uh, some, some philosophical nuance to some of it. Um, but at the end of the day, the faith is, is a, a, a lifestyle, right? It's something that's lived. Uh, and Jesus wanted us to have abundant life, right? St. Irenaeus said, the glory of God is man fully alive, not fully sanitized and sitting in neat little rows and categorizing things as fun as that can be for some of us. Um, so in, in some sense, it's an indictment against the history of CCD, which has told us that it's all about a textbook and mm -hmm. sitting in a room uh, with some uh, nice volunteer. Where are you leading our faith formation? Where do you see it going in terms of being able to engage kids in a real dynamic relationship with Jesus Christ? Yeah, we've. Um, you can talk to any of our volunteers, and they'll say we've we made it sufficiently messy now. <laughs> There's a certain messiness to it that just has to happen. That's life with kids, right? Um, some, you know, one of those videos where we were looking at our little oratory. Uh, you know, our daughter who's brushing her teeth. As soon as we hit stop, fell face down, scraped the roof of her mouth with her toothbrush, and she's bleeding. <laughs> that's, that's life. Uh, sometimes that happens when you're explaining the Trinity. Somebody might bleed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah. So we're, we're trying to lead faith formation is to the extent that faith formation is a, a there's a, an intellectual component to it. Um, we have to educate kids the way that they learn, not the way that we prefer to educate them necessarily. Um, right. Tom, we want to get nerdy. Thomas Aquinas talks about how information is received according to the mode of the receiver, mm -hmm. which is a complicated way of saying I learn things the way that I learn things. <laughs> so right. if kids in school are there's, you know, the teachers are being trained in differentiated instruction and there's different learning stations and different learning styles and they change activities every seven minutes. If we're going to offer a classroom setting that is just textbook and lecture, that's not the way that they're learning in school, um, that's not going to fly. Education has moved on from that. It's, a, it's an outdated educational model. But the faith isn't just an intellectual enterprise either. Uh, it's a personal thing. Uh, and so the catechist is also in many ways is more of a mentor than a teacher. Um, so there needs to be room for the catechist to breathe uh, their own own life into the topic uh, and, and share, this is how this is important to me. And this is how I pray. And this is, this is, you know, an experience I had of the Holy Spirit and not just make sure we hit all the doctrinal points about who the Holy Spirit is. I think the key is if you can engage, engage kids, adults, people of all ages to realize there's something fascinating about this, something interesting, something exciting that frees us up. We don't have to hit all the doctrinal points because they're going to want to go find it on their own. And we've then earned the right, as you said earlier, we've earned the right to speak to them for the rest of their lives about all this. So we don't have to cover everything there is to know about the sacrament of baptism in first grade. If we pique an interest and then they get more interested later on, we'll, we'll get to the all the nuance of baptism and what is an indelible spiritual mark and all that sort of stuff, uh, which is very, very important because it's true and God's revealed it. Uh, but you don't have to shove all truth into a six-year-old's brain in one year and be done. So in some sense, what you're allowing uh, to happen is instead of asking them questions that they don't care about, we're hearing their questions and then exploring with them how they can start to get to know, understand, and love Jesus Christ through those questions. Now, have you ever done any surveys or have you seen any data points that kind of help you um, orient um, the way in which you're bringing Jesus to our youth? Yeah, especially in the middle school age. Um, so our middle school youth minister, Nick Sharapa, pulled the middle school kids uh, at the beginning of this year to try to figure out what what stuff you guys even interested in, or maybe it was the end of last year, um, to try to figure out, you know, do we do a semester on the creed? Do we cover sacraments? Are they more interested in prayer? Uh, and what he found is they're easily the, the most common theme of questions were deeper philosophical um catechetically foundational questions of who is God? Is there even a God? How can we know there is a God? If there is a God, how do we know what this God is like? Uh, and if there is a God, how do we know that Christianity in general and Catholicism in particular 
is the religion that that God wants us to follow? Why can't we be Buddhist or Jewish or, or insert any other faith here? Um, so if we're, if we're trying to answer questions about the, the form and matter of confirmation, and they're still trying to figure out if there even is a God, we're talking right past each other. Um, so I think in a lot of ways, especially in those, those older ages, I'd say even down to grade four, um, there has to be a certain freedom of, we're not necessarily even following a curriculum. <laughs> the curriculum is what are you interested in? What are you curious about? Um, because if they're, if they're totally, you know, when, when teachers will ask me, catechists will ask me, how do you get the kids interested? I kind of answer somewhat tongue in cheekly. Um, they have to be interested. <laughs> how do you get them to get interested? They have to be interested. Um, so you might not be able to convince them to be interested in the, the form and matter of matrimony in fifth grade because they're not thinking about getting married yet. Uh, but they're probably really interested in angels and demons. <laughs> so let's talk about that a little bit. Um, and you've really designed a, um, a developmental programmatic way to, to help children at every level get to know, love, and Jesus Christ so that ultimately they uh, they get to heaven. Describe a little bit about, you know, I've heard you talk about this before, um, that you feel like there are these pillars, obviously, of our sacramental life, and that's a good thing to go through. And then there's the need to kind of bridge those pillars. Um, so describe a little bit of like what it's like to prepare kids for the sacraments, uh, baptism at birth especially, and then, uh, you know, com confession and communion and confirmation. How do you see that process developing? Yeah, so all of those, those sacramental moments, um, we try not to just look at, we're not just preparing the kid to fruitfully receive the sacrament, we're preparing at least kid and parent, preferably the entire family unit uh, for that sacramental experience as a family. Um, so baptism prep is a little cleaner and easier because there's usually only two of them, right? It's mom and dad. Um, and we try to focus baptism prep on, uh, similar to marriage prep, right? If marriage prep only prepared a couple for the sacrament itself, for, for the, the, the vows at the mass itself, uh, it's done a bad job, right? Marriage prep needs to prepare them to live out marriage over the course of their, their entire marriage. Baptism prep, if all we do is prepare you to, to participate well in the ceremony itself, um, that's a good thing, but we've ultimately failed you uh, because that ceremony is going to last 20 minutes, 30 minutes, maybe an hour. Um, but baptism, you know, you're making promises as a parent in the baptism, right? Yes, I fully understand what I'm about to undertake. Do you? <laughs> Do you have any idea what you're trying to undertake? Why don't we explain to you what you're saying you're going to undertake and then give you a, a basic approach to how you can go about doing that? So we focus our baptism prep on, yes, we cover the sacrament of baptism. What are the signs and symbols and all that kind of stuff? But we spend the bulk of the time on how do you be Christian parents and raise Christian kids? Uh, and what is this church going to do, do to support you in that? Because what, we, what we've done a lot in the church is we fail families when they need us the most, which is right after the birth of their first kid. Uh, if you think about every family when they're having their first kid, they restructure their social lives around this little being. Uh, they do all this research about, is it better to listen to Mozart or Bach while they're still in the womb? What uh, color palette should be in the book that we're reading to them? And we're not part of that conversation. Um, and then after the 90 minute baptism prep class that focuses on a 20 minute ceremony, we disappear for seven to eight years. And then we come back into their lives and demand that they jump through certain hoops to get sacraments that they don't understand. Uh, meanwhile, we've abandoned them. <laughs> they, they've restructured their lives and moved on and we're not a part of it. So a big follow up to baptism prep is we want to be part of your life. I refer to it as a bridge from baptism prep to first communion prep. Right? We want to walk with you as you try to figure out how do I raise this kid in the faith? What kind of resources are there? What are, you know, we're struggling as parents now because there's a, there's a, a, a needy kid and our, our marriage has changed. Uh, our family life is different than what it used to be. As kids get older and they start asking questions and they start talking back and they start, then you have to discipline. Um, how do I do that as a Christian parent? And I juggle, they don't always phrase it this way, but what they're asking is how do I mirror mercy and justice at the same time? <laughs> um, that's a hard thing, but it's, it's our call as parents. Um, that's really, that's faith formation. <laughs> Every parent who gives their little two-year-old consequences for their tantrums is doing faith formation. <laughs> so if we baptize a baby a couple months after birth, what can we possibly do with them to have them develop their faith at that age? Have you developed anything along those lines to help children and parents to bond with Jesus at that age? Yeah, so we use a beautiful little program called Making Music Praying Twice, um, which that video was kind of an, an adapted home version of that. Um, it's a, a, a cool little program. It uses nursery rhymes. It's not explicitly catechetical, right? It uses nursery rhymes. It uses 
um, some church songs, different spirituality, uh, spirituals from different cultures and things like that. Every session begins with a prayer. Every session ends with prayer and it's structured on the liturgical year. So you're seeing the different colors and things like that. Um, very, very kid friendly. The whole point is we're trying to model for parents. How do you pray with little kids uh, and do it in a, a, a fun way? And then hopefully we're going to instill habits that will last for the rest of their lives. Um, so that's one one beautiful way of doing it. Um, another thing we try to encourage parents to do, all the research that you read about reading to your children, all those, those benefits happen if you read Bible stories to your children. And all those benefits happen if you sing hymns to your children. Um, they pick up on, on early childhood literacy rates go up the more you read to your kids because they're picking up on a vocabulary and, and sentence structure and things like that. Same thing happens if you're reading to them from your, your kid's Bible. They're, they're picking up on faith language even before they can articulate any of it. Um, Does that give you a little piece of knowing that you've thrown out the old CCD curriculum books uh, and that you've replaced it with God's word? Yeah, the Bible is, is uh, the center point. I keep referring to it as uh, let's just return to the sources, right? The primary catechetical texts that we have are the Bible and a catechism. Um, textbooks have their values in, in certain certain circumstances, but they're a little bit intimidating for parents sometimes, too. They're intimidating for volunteers, uh, and every family recognizes they just throw them away at the end of the year. But they all keep their Bibles and they all keep their catechisms. Uh, so why don't we use those things and teach them how to use those tools? We don't need to be afraid of the Bible. It's actually our book. We should probably be familiar with our family history a little bit. So how do you introduce, uh, you know, maybe a, a, just growing up a little bit from a, a little baby, maybe a, a preschool student, a child or a kindergartner to the Bible? Yeah, I think it starts with um, it's easiest to start with Bible stories. I would never tell a family not to read the actual scripture to their kids. I think that's a, a beautiful thing. Um, some of those stories are not kid friendly. So you kind of need the cleaned up, you know, kids Bible version of it. Uh, my, my kids like to point out cause they're a DRE's kid. So they know stuff like this. Uh, after David kills Goliath, he cuts his head off. That's not in the kid's Bible <laughs> Bible storybook, but it's part of the story. Uh, right. Noah had some problems after the flood that they don't include in the story. So you want to, you know, you want a, a, an age appropriate presentation of scripture. Um, and the life of Jesus is a great place to start cause that's where scripture culminates. Um, you know, he's the, the center of our faith. Uh, so getting to know the life of Jesus from an early age is a great, great thing. What about uh, now moving to the next uh, pillar, which is uh, confession? What can second graders understand about guilt, sin, grace, mercy, and the joy and freedom that comes through reconciliation? Yeah, I think... Um... I think kids get it and, you know, they, they generally get confession a lot more than we think that they do. You know, I think the, the impression is kids are afraid of it and, and it's a scary thing. I'm often curious, do we as adults impose our, our fears of telling a priest our sins on our kids who wouldn't have that other, otherwise? Um, you know, kids have been, I, I like to tell parents of second graders, you have been preparing your child for confession from the moment you made them fess up to doing something wrong. <laughs> Uh, if you give them consequences, you make them say they're sorry. You know, my wife for a while has had uh, with our kids, if, if they commit, you know, a run of the mill thing that we don't like, a simple I'm sorry is okay. If they deliberately smack their sibling in the head with the baseball bat, then there's a whole different parameter around that. You have to say, I am sorry for hitting you in the head. That was wrong because <laughs> mom and dad saw it and I got cut. No, <laughs> All right, that was wrong because why? They have to articulate however they can why that was wrong. Next time I will. How am I going to handle the situation better? Um, if you think about it, that's the act of contrition, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry for my sins with all my heart. I'm going to try my best not to do it again with your help, Lord. Um, so you're teaching them from a young age. Number one, some, some sins are worse than others. Um, and the ones that are worse, there's a more, more ritualized way you have to apologize for that. Um, that's what God expects of us as well as adults uh, and as kids. So from a young age, you're, we're teaching them, you have to own your mistakes. Uh, you have to own your sins, especially because uh, a sin is not a mistake. Um, and, you know, all that the parental coaching that goes into that and showing your kids you did something wrong. There's a consequence. But mommy still loves you. Daddy still loves you. Um, that's critical. Uh, and that is sacramental preparation. That's so true. I think that's important. I think kids get this, that there's one thing it, to reach across uh, the table to, to maybe get the sugar and you accidentally knock over a glass of milk. And that's a mistake. It's not a sin because it wasn't like the intentional purpose of reaching across the table was to knock down 
uh, the milk. But it would be a different thing if uh, you took the glass of milk and threw it at your brother. So those are the things that like you do on purpose and those things that happen by mistake. And what's so beautiful about that, that that leads us right into one of the great gifts that we have. And to me, there is no Catholic church without the Eucharist, no communion, no church. Uh, talk about what it's like to see these kids prepare for first communion and then to be a part of that uh, gift of all gifts, which is Jesus Christ in the heart of our children. Yeah, it's an awesome, awesome thing because, uh, you know, it's it's the source and summit of the faith. And it's um, on the surface of it. It's it's uh, I don't think I'm too far off by saying it's it's somewhat ridiculous. Right. This looks like bread. It tastes like bread. It smells like bread. I can drop it on the ground. But this is God. Mm. Um, that's how vulnerable God makes himself to us. Um, and I don't think kids question that as much as adults do, because um, there's especially in, in second grade, you know, they're, they're just at the age of reason. Um, they're still very concrete thinkers, but they're starting to think more abstractly. So I think kids get it much more easily than adults. If, if Jesus is God and Jesus said this is his body, it has to be his body. Full stop. <laughs> um, right. so kids, kids get it uh, and they're, they're, they're comfortable with it. They're excited with it. Um, you know, they're starting to recognize, um, you know, especially in health classes, when you eat something, it becomes physically part of your body. Um, so that's how we present Jesus to them in communion is why, why did Jesus come as bread when he could have showed up as a lamb, as he does in the book of Revelation? He could have been a whirlwind as he does with Job. Um, you know, he could have shown up in one of, as one of a myriad of ways that God appears in the Bible. Why did he pick bread? Because um, he wants to be food for us. He wants to be part of your body and your soul and to live inside of you and you become a living tabernacle. Um, and they, they, they get it. Kids like that a lot. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the whole um, uh, push anymore towards having high self-esteem and anti-bullying and all that sort of stuff. When you present to a kid like you're a walking tabernacle, what do we do to the tabernacle when you walk into the church? We show immense reverence for the tabernacle because of what it holds. And you're a tabernacle. So you should show immense reverence for you as well and for everybody else who was receiving Jesus. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's an awesome age to, to present communion. You know, that simplicity also cuts to something. I remember uh, a doctor of the church, St. Robert Bellarmine, right at the time. I mean, if you think about just the perspective of our faith, for 1,500 years, uh, all Christians were taught and believed that Christ was present in the Eucharist. And it was only at the Protestant Revolution where that started to, to decay. Anyway, uh, there was a Jesuit priest, uh, uh, St. Robert Bellarmine. He was in a debate about whether Jesus is present in the Eucharist. And he goes, okay, to summarize, and he looks to his opponent and say, you say Jesus is not in the, in the Eucharist. Jesus says, this is my body. Who am I supposed to believe? And <laughs> that really is the question is, we just take Je Jesus for what he said. And I think uh, John 6 is a great way, the whole um, bread of life discourse. Now, moving along with that, how do you bridge the gap between those two intense sacramental uh, moments to confirmation? What's done in between that, those years of development? Yeah, what's going on developmentally in there is is um, there's a lot of fun stuff going on, right? So fourth and fifth grade in particular. So third grade, I think, is an excellent opportunity to, you know, the church's words, to do mystagogy on these two awesome sacraments you received in second grade, to, to really marinate in, you have an experience of God's mercy and God's intimacy in the Eucharist. Um, I, I feel like that's, a, that's an important year, and we often miss that. Um, but then by fourth and fifth grade, what's going on in the kid's brain is they're starting to systematize their knowledge, right? So I've heard this in history class and I've heard this in science and you said this at faith formation and how do those all go together? So they start asking some really, really interesting questions in those ages and they're, they're, they're formulating an early version of their worldview. Um, so those are critical, critical years to be able to, to kind of go off script and not just present you know, typically in fifth grade, most curriculum, most curricula go through the sacraments, uh, which is important. And sometimes their questions relate to that, but sometimes they're not worried about the form and matter of a sacrament. They're more worried about um, Bible history or church history or uh, stuff going on in the church today. Um, or if going, you know, that's the age where they really start questioning if going to mass, missing mass on Sunday is a mortal sin when there's a, a an obligation there isn't right now. Um, and my family doesn't go every Sunday. What does that mean? So they're starting to put these pieces together and they're really starting to figure out, um, am I going to be all in with this faith or am I not going to be all in with this faith? And a lot of that comes down to how is their family living it, right? And then by by middle school, they're starting to ask those deep questions of, 
does God even, in some ways you might think we've, we've, you've been a, in a, a Catholic formation experience for five, six years now. Why are you questioning if there is a God? Um, but that's really at the forefront of their mind by middle school. Um, so we have to embrace those questions uh, and address them um, intelligently and intentionally uh, and not just brush them aside as we've been over this before. You need to not worry about it. Um, you know, a lot of people will point to that the statistic out there that some ugly percentage of people leave the faith after Catholic after confirmation. Um, I'm convinced confirmation is not the hemorrhage point. The hemorrhage point is fourth, fifth, sixth grade when they're starting to ask these questions. They're systematizing their knowledge, and a lot of times we're not engaging the topics they're interested in, or we're uh, you know we're kind of boring them out of the church at that point, and then we're putting parents in a bad position of you've got to force them to keep keep at this and let's just get to confirmation. Um, so we've kind of, in a lot of ways, the CCD system has designed the graduation mentality for confirmation. Um, we've kind of forced families into that. They have to just kind of stick it out for the sake of their kids and get to, get to confirmation, but we haven't been addressing their questions for years. <laughs> so this is irrelevant for them. So wow. in, your, in your mind, part of the solution is uh, to inspire our catechists and obviously our parents to continue to develop with the children a relationship with Jesus Christ, especially in between uh, communion and confirmation. So yeah. let's pretend that that doesn't happen. And, uh, you know, it's just too hard, or maybe just the busyness of family life or just the difficulties that there are in our world today. What do you do with a child who um, the parents are presenting for confirmation, but they don't believe in God? Yeah, I think uh, we try as much as we can to show the kids, you know, similar to, to my, um, relationship with Natalie. You don't have to do this. I don't want to violate your conscience. If you don't believe there's a God, I don't want you to stand up in front of a bishop and claim you do. Um, so wait a second, hold on. You're saying that the kid doesn't have to get confirmed if he's questioning truly the existence of God. Yep. And why, I would, would that, why would that be true? I mean, I understand what you're saying. Obviously, yeah. it's true for you and your marriage. You didn't force Natalie to be Catholic to marry you. So how does that translate into confirmation in the sacramental life of the church? Yeah, so we talk about, um, you know, parents typically, and it's a good instinct. Parents want their kids to receive the sacraments. That's a good thing. That's part of what you swore to do at baptism, right, is to present your kids at the right time for baptism or for, for sacraments. There is the the external celebration of the sacrament, right? The bishop has to have the right the right oil and say the right prayer at the right time in the right way. But the person receiving the sacrament has to have the right disposition or the sacrament isn't going to take effect. Right. Um, you know this very well, Father. Right. I could I could receive communion every single day and never be changed. Right. I'm never open to it. I could go to confession every day and not actually have my sins be forgiven if I'm not sorry for them. So if I present myself to a bishop to confirm me, to send the Holy Spirit upon me so that I can embrace my mission and go out and fulfill it in the world. But I don't believe in the God who's supposed to do any of that. It's it's actually sacrilege. Um, you're, you're, you're giving the appearance of a sacrament that's going to have no fruit uh, or very likely not to have any fruit at all. So we try to present to the can candidates like you need to freely. It, we have to walk a fine line, right? You have to freely choose this, but you're also a minor in your parents' house and uh, you kind of have to go along with your parents as well. But we want we try again, we try to work with the family unit. We want to encourage the family. If this child isn't ready yet. The fact that they're asking questions is a good thing. So let's keep asking those questions. Let's keep answering those questions. And we'll eventually get to the point where they're ready and they want to do this. Um, but if we force them into it now, I don't know how we're going to help them by, by making them do something they don't want to do. We don't want to present God as the bully, right? God is just going to force his way and force his sacrament on us. Because um, then you're basically forcing the kid to have, they have no options except to walk away from this, this despot deity. So you go through confirmation if, uh, you know, you feel like they're prepared and the parents have discerned that properly. So now what about high school? Um, would you apply the same criteria for confirmation as you would to going to Sunday mass? What if you wake up as a high school kid and you're a sophomore and you just don't feel like going to church? Do you, would you recommend that parents just, uh, what would you recommend they do? Yeah, I would recommend um, frank conversations with them to figure out what is it that you'd why don't you like going to mass or why maybe even like isn't the right word, but what, you know, what's your hang up with mass? What's the issue? Uh, are you not getting anything out of it? Are you bored? Are you whatever? And then you can try to figure out how can we address those things? A huge way to get more out of mass is to read the readings ahead of time, right? 
hopefully by the time our kids are in high school, we have showed them how do you actually hear God speak to us through his word, through the scriptures. Um, Because that's what happens throughout at least half of mass, right? Is God talks to us through scripture. Uh, And then it's interwoven throughout the rest of the mass as well. Um, If you don't know how to hear God speak to you through scripture, um, you're probably not going to get a whole lot out of mass. You'll get communion, which is great. That's not to say that Jesus is not a whole lot. Um, but I think you need to try to identify what is the hang up. Sometimes in high school, it's just a pushback on authority. Um, that might not have anything to do with the church, with God, with mass, with anything. It's just, this is where they are developmentally and it's part of growing up. Um, I would caution parents, you know, kids who, who push back on the faith, they all do it. We all, I did it to my mom as well in high school. Uh, even as I was the kid who never, ever missed youth group, never missed mass on Sunday, was given witness talks about possibly being a priest someday. I give my mom flack about practicing the faith in certain ways as well. Uh, There's a natural developmental thing going on there. Um, I can't necessarily tell any one parent how to handle that with their, with their child, uh, other than to say it's normal. Um, You need to pray your way through it and you need to have honest conversations with your kid because there, there is that tension of they're becoming more independent, but they are still your dependent. Um, So you don't, you don't give up your role as parent, but the role is starting to shift then. Right, and I think that's the that's the real challenge of of uh, parenting and of being a priest today is trying to um, inspire a real desire to freely choose Jesus Christ, and that relationship becomes so natural, and you want to be a part of uh, you know going to the Eucharist and listening to His Word, and in the end, that's the real criteria, catechism book or so for everything that you do, right? You just uh, to engage the families, to have a Sunday reading of scripture or to read Sunday scripture. And what a great way to, to do that. How are you inspiring families to do that now? And why is that so important to perhaps uh, read the Sunday scriptures at home and in the family? Yeah. So a lot of what we've done programmatically is tried to focus our lessons on the Sunday gospels. There's some challenges to that, but it, it, in general, I think it's, it's a very good approach. Um, and in our programs, we're trying to give kids, let them hear multiple voices and multiple learning styles on the same topic. So utilizing the Sunday scriptures for your your family's faith formation at home, not even in a classroom setting here, uh, is wonderful because they're going to hear a homily on it if you go to Mass. Um, The music is, music at Mass is tied into the theme of the liturgy. So you're going to get music that is reinforcing those scriptural themes in that gospel. And then you read it at home either before or after Mass, or I'd say do it both, right? Read it before Mass, hear it at Mass, read it again throughout the week at home. Uh, and just share what what jumps out to you through that. Um, that experience of Mass is going to help you get more out of it because you're going to hear the prayers of the liturgy, you're going to hear the music, you're going to hear the homily, and you'll get a lot of different perspectives on the same topic. Um, that can help you hear God speak to you more through those scriptures. Yeah, it, to me, one of the biggest challenges of of just trying to inspire uh, the reading of scripture and coming to Mass has to do with what social media has done to our children of making it so eye-centered when they realize that they're a gift to the world and that gift is truly healed and enhanced by Jesus Christ in the greatest sense, then reading scripture becomes like, well, what is God telling me? So this is my game plan. It becomes my daily way in which I can hear God and through receiving him, can give him to others. You know, a frequently asked question that I've seen, uh, especially that this during this Corona time is, how are we going to relate to our youth, do our youth programming, perhaps under these social distancing restrictions and things. What are, what are some things that you and your team are thinking of, um, just kind of briefly, uh, like maybe with VBS or some other things that you could see coming down the line for the future of our great grouping? Yeah, so we are trying uh, in a lot of ways to get things, you know, things like VBS. Typically, it's a gathered thing with about 300 people here. Um, that's not going to be appropriate right now. We don't want to get rid of it, so we're making it virtual and, uh, and delivering it in a format that can happen at home. Uh, with volunteers recording videos and things like that. Um, With some of our our bulkier faith formation programs as well, again, we don't want to have 300 people on site in small spaces. Um, So we're trying to find ways of um, creating easy to follow with clear guidance uh, and meaningful experiences of family prayer and family uh, faith formation and discussion at home, using scriptures and using an age-appropriate catechism. Uh, And then we're taking a look at other programs to figure out Um, what stuff can we do on site to help support parents uh, and kids for that matter as well. Um, But we're really trying to seize this opportunity as let's help parents do what is their inalienable right to do, which is form their own kids in the faith. 
Um, you know your kids better than I do. I can, I can help you answer all the theological questions you come up with. Um, but your example as a parent is going to be far more influential than mine, even in those troubled teenage years, <laughs> right? All the, all the, the uh, research shows that teenagers, the biggest influence in their life is still their parents. Yeah. So really the best way we could encourage parents to help is just jump in. Yeah. It's kind of like what my mom did with my baseball team, but just see it as an opportunity to, uh, really allow the Lord to work through you to bring your child to heaven. I can't think of a greater goal than uh, than getting your child to heaven. Uh, Jason, what a great conversation. I feel like we could go on for hours and maybe yeah. at some point we do uh, do that. But um, at any rate, I really appreciate you coming on exploring Catholicism. And uh, just as a little program note to all those who are watching, I'm looking forward to next Tuesday, which will be uh, June 23rd at 2 p.m. We're going to have uh, Montez Alvarado. She is a, uh, works at the Beckett Fund. She's one of the top uh, thinkers and lawyers there who are defending the Little Sisters of the Poor as they're being currently sued in the Supreme Court by our state of Pennsylvania. And so uh, led by uh, some of the state officials and things, they're trying to sue the Little Sisters of the Poor to force them to um, pay for abortions and to pay for contraceptions for those uh, people who work with them. So I'm going to bring Montez Alvarado on to the show to talk about some of those legal things and explore how Catholicism is defending some of the uh, the, the most treasured aspects of our faith, our, our dear nuns who are doing right now uh, just the most heroic work of taking care of our elderly, especially the little sisters of the poor. You always hear those little sisters of the poor a bit end of every joke, you know, oh, the little sisters of the poor are going to play this team and that. And they always are like these that are bad news bears of things. But the little sisters of the poor are the ones who are out on the front line taking care of our most vulnerable and some of the most precious gifts we have, which are our grandparents. So I look forward to exploring Catholicism next week, June 23rd at 2 p.m. And I hope that all of us are, are able to take into consideration what we've heard today through the eyes and through exploring life and the youth and his family through Jason Gualdo. So let us end with a little simple prayer. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.